Here we go. I remembered to start the video. Okay. So randomization statistics. You'll also occasionally hear these called resampling statistics as well. Um, essentially, it relies on resampling our samples many, many times. And randomization, we're going to use a subset or some recombined sets of our observed data, the data that we actually went out into the world and measured. And we're going to use that to estimate confidences in our measurements or to compare samples that we've gotten or really anything that you would have done or that you learned to do in biostatistics, you can do a randomization equivalent of that. And it, um, it's using this other approach that we're using some subset of our data or lots of subsets of our data or recombining it. And we do this many, many times. The point is that we take these subsets of the re these recombined uh, sets many, many times. So we have three basic um, approaches I'm going to talk about today. Uh, first off, some confidence estimation. The two ones here is the original jackknife, which is one of the first uh, permutation or randomization statistics that uh, happened or people started using, and also the bootstrap. And then also a null hypothesis significance test, a permutation test, or also sometimes called a randomization test. There's actually a slight difference between a true permutation and true randomization test, but we'll talk about that. It's not really important for here. Um, one reason that I'm really bringing this up now is there's a lot of fields that we're going to be talking about later that rely on uh, randomization statistics. Uh, when we start talking about spatial data, spatial data uses a lot of randomization statistics. When we start talking about uh, genetic data and doing genomics or phylogenetics or other things like this, they use a lot of randomization statistics because traditional statistics are not flexible enough to handle those situations uh, very well. And so randomization statistics is what ends up getting used. So why in the world use this instead of a normal process that you've learned already? Well, first off, they don't rely on your data coming from a population of normally distributed data. If you do a normal t-test or an ANOVA test, you need to come from a normally distributed um, uh, population for it to actually be a valid test because it's making those assumptions. I mean, you can crank other types of data and you can throw it into a, a t-test and actually get an answer out. But that doesn't mean that that answer is going to be trustworthy if your, uh, the population that you're drawing from hasn't come from a normal distribution. Also, you don't have to rely on your samples if you're comparing two samples of having equal variance. There's another thing that you have to assume when you're doing normal parametric statistics is that the samples or the multiple samples that you're looking at all have equal variances. And this is not the case, again, with randomization statistics. We are not relying on them having the same variances. Again, this is a type of essentially shortcut that we've used in parametric statistics to make parametric statistics doable on paper with 10. So we assume they're normal, we assume the populations are normal, we assume they have uh, equal variances, and this makes it so that we can develop a method that we can do with pen and paper. Fortunately, we don't have to do things on pen and paper anymore, so we don't have to necessarily make those assumptions. Also, You'll probably notice, well, okay, if you don't have a normal distribution and if you have unequal variances, hey, we can just use a non-parametric test. Well, there's problems with parametric tests as well. And essentially, what you do with a parametric test or non-parametric test is to begin to throw away some of your data, like assigning ranks instead of actually using the actual data or something else like this, to coax it into something that you can, again, more easily do on pen and paper. It, again, so relying on shortcuts. Uh, well, actually, so what happens then is with a, in a randomization test, we don't have to throw away data to get a non-parametric test to work. And so we have increased power. Again, if you don't remember from biostats or uh, took a stats class, power is the ability of a test to be able to reject the null hypothesis if that is warranted. So if you actually have a, dis, uh, a difference between populations, how easily or was the probability that we can detect that difference. And that is uh, the power of a test. And then the, the last thing is this is really flexible. We can apply randomization statistics to a whole wide variety of situations which there's not a standard statistical test to approach that data or approach that. So 
this is one of the big reasons, and actually it makes it really easy to adapt statistical tests to new things. Like, for instance, if you were to sit down, you have totally new data, and you don't really, if there's not like a, a test, like a, like a published standardized parametric test that you can fit this data into, um, it's very unlikely that you are going to sit down and figure out how to make a new parametric test to analyze that. Um, however, all that being said, it's not uncommon for people who have no more statistical training than I do, which is not a ton, um, to be able to sit down with, with data that doesn't fit any traditional test and be able to think, okay, how would I use a randomization or permutation test to test this and actually come up with a essentially a novel test for that? So it, it provides this flexibility that you, if you understand the concepts of a permutation test, can do this fairly easily and adapt this to new situations. So that's kind of one of the, some of the great things about randomization tests. And then, which would lead me to the question about sitting there, so why didn't I learn about this in biostatistics when I was taking it, or whatever else I took? And number one, they're relatively new. I mean, actually, permutations tests actually go back a really long ways. Uh, in truth, like for instance, the Fisher exact test, uh, a really old test, and you probably learned a little bit about that if you took biostatistics. Does he talk about the Fisher exact test in, in biostats? Okay, a Fisher exact test is actually technically a permutation test. Um, so, but it's a really, really simplified, low computation permutation test. Most of them require tons of computing power to perform. We are going to be resampling our data thousands to tens of thousands to maybe even up to millions of times. That is insanely hard to do on pen and paper. It takes a computer no time at all. I can do like a, a normal like t-test type data that you would do. Say we have two samples, maybe 20 observations in, in samples. On my little laptop here in R, I can do 1,000 or 10,000 randomizations of that in seconds. It would take you days on pen and paper. Uh, so it's really taking advantage of that. So. Uh, they they have not been used a lot until relatively recently. However, that being said, these are becoming one of the most common statistical approaches in biology. Um, they're still not used nearly as much overall as, again, NOVA and a t-test. Those are really entrenched classical methods. However, that being said, in certain fields, especially new and emerging fields, tend to use more permutation tests and randomization tests than do more of your classical fields like physiology and stuff. So um, it is something that is used increasingly more. I actually was like looking on some background material and watching some like uh, lectures from actual statisticians on this. And one statistician that I was, I was reviewing a lecture from actually called Permutation and Randomization Statistics, one of the most powerful discoveries ever in statistics. I don't know if I quite call it that, but but he would know more than me. He's a statistician. Okay, so the first one that we're going to talk about is a jackknife. Um, has anyone looked at the uh, loop homework yet? Okay, a couple of you. The rest of you have. Actually, so so I I, I actually coaxed you guys to do a jackknife in the homework. Um, so. This actually will end up being what you did on the homework after you hooked on the homework. Um, or the homework or the assessment. I don't know what I'm calling things anymore. Anyways, uh, so a jackknife is just a way to estimate our confidence around some sort of sample statistics, such as a mean or a standard deviation or something else like that. How confident can we be in that sample statistic? And one thing I just want to point out is the standard deviation is not a confidence around uh, a mean. A standard deviation is a measure of the spread of the data itself. So we have a normal distribution as relying essentially on a nor the, the data being normally distributed. So if you have a normal distribution and you have the mean plus you have the standard deviation, I can tell you essentially everything about that normal distribution. I can tell you if I have that mean and standard deviation, if I go out so far from it, I can tell you how many should be in 
so far from the tail out here, I can tell you how much is in the tail out here, or something like this. I can tell you essentially everything about that normal distribution from the mean and standard deviation. But the standard deviation is not a way to estimate how confident, confident am I about this mean from a sample. That's not what it's telling you. It's giving you a measure of the dispersion of the data. So most of the time, we would like to estimate our confidence in our sample statistics. And there's actually parametric ways to estimate uh, our confidence, like a 95% confidence interval around a mean. Parametrically, it's really complicated, and people are generally not taught how to do that in statistics. Um, however, it's generally also a good idea, especially if you have a small or medium sample size. Um, and this, what the jackknife does is involves finding the sample statistic iteratively, so again and again and again, and it does it by leaving out one of the observations every time we do it. So we'll do it once, and we'll leave out the first observation, and take the, take the mean, or the median, or whatever else it is. We'll drop the second observation now, and then find the mean again, and then drop the third observation, and find the mean again, and keep going like that. So let me give you an example of what this would look like with a really small data set. Imagine if I have the numbers 3, 7, 5, 9. Those are my, my sampled values. Imagine this is the ages of children that showed up in my front yard this morning. I don't know. Um, I try to fit it to somebody. The actual mean of the children that showed up in my front yard this morning is six. But I want to estimate my confidence around this. Imagine they came from a population. I don't know where that population is because this has never happened before to me. Uh, but they must have come from a population. I want to estimate my confidence that the mean age of the children from this population is six years old. I don't know where that came from. It's, <laughs> it's early in the morning, so you get better randomness from me. Anyways, okay, so what we can do is we can do a jackknife where we iteratively leave out the means of everything, or one of these values, and then take the mean again. So the first time we do it, we have seven, five, nine. Leaving out the first observation, we get seven. Okay, that's, that's our first uh, jackknife mean would take. And then we take the mean, leaving out the second one, 359, and that gives us a mean of 5.6 repeated. And then we get a mean, leaving out the third one of 379, and we get a mean of 6.33. And then we finally leave out the final one, the 9, and get a mean of 375, and that's 5. So now we have this population of new means that we generated leaving out one of each of these. And we can use this, this distribution of resampled means to estimate our confidence around the true mean. So for instance, one of the things that we can do is we can actually get 95% quantiles of this, which I won't go in exactly how to do that right now other than I will show you how to calculate an R because here where you actually don't have more than it's really hard to, yeah, it's going to take more time than I'm really willing to invest in you all. Um, but, but suffice it to say, it comes out to be about five, okay, we have a stretch of two, so it would be 5.05 to 7 point, no, 6.95 would be my 95% confidence error. Essentially, the 95% confidence interval is if we were to resample this over and over and over again, 95% of our resamplings would fall within this range. And this is going to be one of the, the major uh, confidence estimates that we use for actually finding our uh, confidence around the mean. So that would be what it is for this if we were to actually run that on out. Um, essentially, this is just leaving out 2.5% from the beginning, so 0 0.05 as leaving out, so our actual range is 5 to 7 that we found, and we're leaving out 2.5 uh, and 97.5% here, which is if you have that small of value, or only 4, then that's the best way to do it. Okay, 
So let's actually do a jackknife example in R. Actually, I have. Open, please. Okay, try to make this a little bit. Okay, okay. So here's what we have. So first off, I'm just gonna read in those residential sales from 2012. Let's go ahead and do that. So there we go. I just save it in there as data, and then what we can do is we can kind of take a look at what the distribution of this is. So this is the distribution. Um, this is a histogram. Essentially what a histogram does is breaks up your range of values that you have. And actually, let me make this a little bit easier to, to see. Um, call equals gray, and then uh, breaks equals 40. Uh, essentially, all you have to do is to, to call up a histogram is type in hist is the command in parentheses, the first uh, thing that you give it is just a vector of numbers. So here we're just gonna use data and price. And then you can use call to make color, and that actually adds color inside the bar, which will make it a little bit easier to see. And then breaks, there's several different things you can do with breaks, but essentially, uh, if you just give it one number, it'll try to give you as close to, with natural breaks, those many bars as it can. Um, I'm gonna do breaks equals 40. Let's zoom into that again. Okay, so here's a histogram of, that looks pink now, uh, the price. And essentially what it does is it breaks up the entire range of prices that we have into bins, and then the bar upwards is um, how many occurred in that bin. So this looks like this is in 50,000 increments up to 2,000. So from zero to 50,000, we had, I don't know, like 30, uh, houses sold for that from 50 to 100,000. We have somewhere like uh, 75. Uh, from 100,000 to 150,000, we're up over 150 of those sold. So that's how you read a histogram. A couple things that you can notice about this first off, it's not normally distributed. This is a very skewed distribution. And so we could take a mean and standard deviation for this. The problem with the standard deviation is it actually doesn't, I mean, it assumes that you have a normal distribution, and actually what you would get then is probably a standard, like one tail of the standard deviation coming almost down to zero, almost up to here, and it could make you think that you have a normal distribution cap around that. It gives you some idea of the spread, but it's not necessarily the most informative way to describe that. But it would be nice to know, okay, given this sampling that we have, what, what is our mean and then what can be our confidence around that mean? So let's look at what the mean is. The mean of all that data is 220,308, $308.70. It's important to 70 cents there, not really. Okay. So let's look at this, what I can use for a jackknife here, right here. So I'm gonna set up a vector to receive my, my means that I'm going to generate. I'm going to generate one mean or essentially for every data point, leaving out that one data point. And so if we look at this, I'm going to generate somewhere in the neighborhood of a lot of means. Uh, the data has, let's see here, 675 lines in it. So we're going to have like 675 different means that we generate. And in this loop, what I'm going to do is then for i, i in one through the length of the data price, that's the vector I'm going to actually do these means on. I'm going to price.mi, so every time it iterates, it's going to be plugging in the next element in this vector with the mean 
of the data dollar sign price minus i. So leaving out the i uh, uh, observation. So every time we iterate, so one, we're going to fill in the first element of price dot m with the mean of data dollar sign price minus the first observation. The second time we're going to fill in the second one with the mean minus the second observation and so on and so on. So let's go ahead and run that. Now if we look at price.m down here, what you will get is all of these different means that are very close to the same but slightly different. And we can get the 95% confidence interval with this command up here. Quantile, so quantile will give you essentially, if you look at, if you give it a whole bunch of numbers, it will give you then these proportions of where that distribution kind of lies, or that spread of numbers. So if I say 0 or 0 0.025 as the second argument, well, the first argument is just the vector that you're going to be looking at. The second argument is going to be 0 0.025. This is 2.5% in. So if we're starting from the lowest value and working our way up, when we get to the value that is the 2.5% value, we're going to get a cut off there. And also the 97.5% value. So essentially, if we're moving down from the top, then 2.5%. Uh, so essentially what we're doing is we're leaving out the 5% most extreme values and what is then the mean. This will give us the 95% confidence interval or 95% of our values are going to be within these two values that gives us back to this. So if we run this, what we get here is then a 95% confidence jackknife interval from 219,000 592 to 220,645. And so we have gotten a confidence interval or a, a measure of confidence around that mean. Okay, that's jackknifing. It is the simpler of them, so I started out with that. However, that being said, jackknifing actually isn't used that much anymore. It's used occasionally. But again, this was the computationally less expensive way to go about doing this. It's not used that much anymore. Bootstrapping is. So the next way, and bootstrapping is essentially similar to that, is that it's similar to jackknifing that we're using this to estimate confidences. However, bootstrap is something that is used very often in statistics. This is going to be one of the main ways that we're estimating confidence in phylogenies and stuff like that. We can use this any time that we calculate something from a group of numbers. We, or some data, it doesn't actually have to be numbers, it can be all sorts of different data. We can bootstrap that data to get an estimate of our confidence in whatever we calculate from that. So, um, so we're going to use this to estimate the confidence of a sample statistic or calculation. And instead of leaving out iteratively one number, what we're going to do is we're going to resample our data with replacement. So essentially what we are going to do is we are going to take our bag of numbers and we are going to pull one number out and say, we're going to make a new data set. And we're going to do that by pulling a number out and saying, okay, our new data set, pull out one number, it's whatever. Put it back in the bag, shake it up, pull out another number. So every time that we sample a number to make a new data set, we are putting it back in the bag. And eventually we'll reach a data set of the same length. So let me give you an example of this. So imagine we have, again, the numbers of these crazy kids that showed up in my yard this morning, and they are 3, 7, 5, and 9. And the mean of those kids' age is 6. So if we wanted to bootstrap this, what we would do is take five resamples with replacement. So we'd come up with a new data set that is of the same length. But for instance, our first one is going to be seven, three, nine, three. 
This just randomly, I, I randomly generated these in R real fast. And essentially what I did is I put all these numbers in a bag and it pulls out one. Like, oh, it's seven. We write down seven. We throw seven back in the bag. We shuffle it up again. Reach back into the bag and get three. Like, okay, three is the next number in our new data set. We throw it back in, shuffle up our bag. We pull out another number, it's nine. Put it back in the bag, shake the bag. And then we get to number three, or we get to our last one, we pull three. Because we put three back in the bag, we can pull it out again, so we get three again. Now, if we didn't do this with replacement, we would pull out the three, or we'd pull out the seven, throw it away. We would pull out the three, we'd throw it away. We'd pull out the nine, pull, throw it away. We get down to our last one, it can only be five, because that's the only thing left in the bag at that point. So what would happen then is if we did this without, or without replacement, or putting those numbers back in the bag so they can be resampled again, we would get the exact same mean every time, because all we would do is get these same numbers, but in a different order. We would permute them. That's not what we want to do. We want to actually get a sub or a resampled uh, data set from our sample. Yes? So to recap, what you're doing is very similar to jackknifing, but instead of ignoring one number, you're choosing a random other number from the same data set instead. Well, no, because what you could actually do is like, I don't have AM. We could actually get nine, 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 nine. It could, they could be all, because we're sampling over and over again, you, every single one has equal probability to come up for every single position. So we're not just replacing one, all of them are getting randomized, but randomized with replacement. So I could sample three, 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 three. I could sample nine, 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 nine. Does that make sense? So you're taking like a random sampling of uh, numbers from your data set mm -hmm. that's just the same length as your original yes. data set? Yes. Okay. Or you're doing it with replacement so that any of those numbers come up again. Essentially all you're doing is, another way to think about it is you're taking the mean again but you're re-weighting them. So some of these are going to be weighted to zero and some of them will be weighted to two or three. That's probably a more complicated way to think about it. So, but yeah, we're just resampling, and you could come out with any sort of combination of these numbers in any frequency. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And so, for instance, in these ones, so I got these resampled data sets, and I now get um, values of 5.5, 5.5, 7.5, 5.5, 7.5, .5, or 7. And again, I can take the quantile of that. Uh, so again, mean, the mean of these means is 6.1. So that will come out very close. And as this gets bigger and bigger and bigger that, that you do this, or you do more and more and more of these resamples, this will approach what your actual mean is. So those should be virtually indistinguishable. But here again, we have a confidence interval now of 5.05 to 7.45. One thing to notice with this is that your confidence intervals with Bootstrap are going to tend on large data sets to be wider than on Jackknife. And actually it turns out those tend to be a little bit more appropriate. If you look at this, we had, this was our confidence interval 5.05 to 6.95, and here it's bumped up. Again, because the main reason here, the largest value we got with Jackknife was seven. The largest value that we get here with the Bootstrap is a 7.5, so it's extending kind of the upper range Okay, so let's go and do an example of bootstrapping and do it with this same data set. Okay, I'm going to use that exact same data set again, the, the prices, and I'm going to set up another vector to receive my randomizations. And again, I'm going to set up then a loop. Now, here's one thing. Before, we could just make the loop the size of our data set. We can't do that this time. We have to choose a number, a number of iterations, because we don't have like a set limit that we're going to go through where we're just leaving one out. So you have to choose a number. I'm going to choose 10,000 different randomizations here. And then we're going to fill again this. All I'm going to do now here is take the mean of uh, the sample of the data set so again, sample is just going to sample or 
do essentially exactly what I was talking about, shake your bag, pull one out, shake your bag, pull one out. But we can tell it to do it either with replacement or without replacement. We need to here do it with replacement, so replace equals T. So we're going to take a sample of data dollar time price with replacement, and if we don't give it any other argument, it will take it to the same length as the original data. It will default to that. So if I just run that just by itself, just to show you what happens, if we look at that data set, we get this, a whole list of numbers. If we take the sample with replacement, we get like basically the same thing, but, but randomized numbers. So let's go ahead and run that. Watch how long this takes for 10,000 different samples. We're done. Um, that, how long? Okay, this is 675 prices. How long would it take you to randomize that 10,000 times? How many, how many grad students for how many days would you have to shove in the room <laughs> to get that? Which actually, by the way, I've heard horror stories of that happening before computers. Um, not actually literally shoving them into a room, but essentially giving them, okay, here's data. I want you to resample. And it usually would only be a hundred times. Which we know now is not that great, but yeah. We can take the quantiles of that. And again, these are going to be a bit wider than what we saw before, which is actually in this case appropriate. Uh, 208,320 uh, to 232,865. So there is a 95% confidence interval. If we look at the mean for data price, it was 223.87. If we look at the mean for uh, our randomization work, it is 223.398. So we're actually only off by about $20 between those. And if you consider how many significant digits that's in, that's it. One, two, okay, one, two, three, four. That's not like the fifth significant digit that they're different. So this is very close to being the same number. It's less than 1% off. It's less than 0.1% off. Wow. Okay. So that is Bootstrap. Just a couple different things about this. What I'm doing right here is technically called a non-parametric bootstrap. The reason for that is we're randomizing based on our actual observed data. Almost all the bootstraps that you will encounter in, in real life are going to be non-parametric bootstraps. There are, however, do exist parametric bootstraps, which these essentially generate our new data sets, not off the observed data, but off a model. We are assuming that, hey, we know what the distribution is. We know what the spread of the distribution is. So we're going to generate a distribution and then sample that distribution rather than sample actual observed data. And that's a parametric bootstrap. Those are relatively, I, I very rarely in what I do encounter parametric bootstraps. It's almost always non-parametric bootstraps. The other thing that you have to kind of ask yourself is then how many resamples do I do? Okay, so I, I stuck in there 10,000. How do I know that I should be doing 10,000? Uh, and these resamples are also sometimes called bootstrap replicates. How many bootstrap replicates should I be doing? And one of the big reasons that you need, this is an important question, is that with more replicates, the variation between subsequent runs that you do goes down. Like if I were to only do three replicates, my variation between every time that I did that would be fairly high. I get different answers because of the randomness that's associated with this process. However, as I do more and more and more replicates, that variation each time is going to go down because it's going to rely less and less on any one randomization. So as I do more, variation between subsequent runs is going to go down. So let me go back to what we were doing here and kind of illustrate this. Let's imagine I only want to run this like three times. Because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm busy. I'm in a hurry. Okay, so here I got 218, uh, 218,227,000. Hey, let's run again. 216,225,000. Hey, we're getting different answers. Fairly off 218 to 222. Wow, that's like 5,000 less than what we just did. 
uh, 208, 231. So it's bouncing around a lot with only three replicates. That makes sense. But if we were to do the 10,000 again, it's going to take a little bit more time. Let's look how much it bounces around. Uh, 208, 562 to 232, 771. 208, 470 to 232, 7, uh, 64. 208, 420 to 232, 640. So the variation now with 10,000 replicates is relatively low. It's not going to change very much. So you want enough replicates so that your data doesn't change at the level of the significant figures of your data or your results. So actually with mine, I probably want to bring that down a little bit more. Uh, I probably want to go to maybe 100,000 because I'm still wiggling around there. However, all that being said, if that's kind of a rule of thumb. In this case, because I actually have a bunch of significant figures with those prices, I probably would do. You generally do not have something measured that accurately over that wide of a range. I probably would be okay if I was down to, if I wasn't changing down to like five significant figures. Um, but that's essentially what you want to do. You want to be able to run this several times and see at the level of precision that you are interested in, the answer doesn't change. As you do more and more, more and more replicates, you're going to converge on an answer. And that's, that's one of the powerful things. Even though we're using randomization, and everyone is going to get a slightly different answer with this, at the level of what you want, you should be getting the same answer every time. OK. So with that, are there any questions on jackknifing or bootstrapping before we go on to permutation hypothesis tests? Yes? Are there uh, built-in functions for doing those? Yes, there are. And I'll introduce you to those, but I also want you to know how to, what's going on. So yeah. Yep, there is actually several functions that allow you to, yeah, just do all of that. Essentially, you just give it the data, number of replicates that you want. Yeah. OK. So a permutation hypothesis test is going to work a little bit differently. Instead of estimating confidence around some sort of mean, we are going to now try to estimate the differences, or is there a significant difference between two or more populations? Like what you would get with a t-test or an ANOVA or something else like that. What we're going to use is randomization of data labels now to test if the data assortment is significantly different than random. Now this might be a little obscure at this moment, but hang in there with me. I'll try to explain it. So the steps that you're going to go about this are, number one, you're going to choose some sort of test stat that you want to calculate between your groups. So imagine I have two groups. Imagine I want to look at the heights of men versus women or something like that. I will have my two groups. I want to look at the mean, or I want to look at the difference between them. One of the things I could do is take the mean of men, take the mean of women, and subtract them, the difference of the means. I could actually do most of like an ANOVA or a um, t-test and get my F statistic or my T statistic and, and do that. It, it's really open to what you want to calculate. After that, then you randomize the data labels to, and recalculate the stat. I take essentially all my heights and then I randomly assort whether they belong to a man or a woman in this case and then recalculate that difference of means or something else like that. And what this does is it creates a distribution to compare our test statistic to. Normally what you're doing is then taking your test statistic and going into a table that someone's already calculated how much of the distribution is outside a certain level. And then you look it up, or R will do it for you, or whatever else, it looks it up. But these are established distributions that we know for certain degrees of freedom. Here you are generating your own distribution, and you will compare your actual observed statistic to the observed statistic that you have made for random data. And then you find what proportion of the randomization stats are more extreme than your test statistic. Okay. So all that, I'll come back to this. This might seem like a little bit foggy at this moment, but let me hang in there. Let's, let's talk about this. A couple things that are really nice about permutation tests. 
Again, this is very much like what we were talking about before. They don't make assumptions about the underlying distributions. They don't have to be normal. We don't necessarily have to have the same uh, variance. They're flexible, so they can be used on a lot of different kinds of uh, data, data that you normally cannot fit into a normal uh, uh, statistical approach. You can choose your own test statistic. This, as it, we go along, is going to be very powerful as well. You can choose, do I want to use a t-stat or do I want to use a difference of means or something else like that. And then again, they're more robust in non-parametric statistics. This is something that we talked about before. Okay, so let's just talk here now about, in practice, how this works. Let me imagine here that I have this hypothesis that taller people sit in the back of the room because they're tall and they can see over people. And they have just been um, trained from early age that you can sit in the back and you can see over people. And maybe short people, like naturally from birth, have been like trained that because you're short, you won't be able to see over people. So you need to sit at the front. I don't know. It's just a random, I don't actually think that. I'm just like giving you something that we can think about here. So let's imagine we have this hypothesis that taller people sit at the back of the room. And so what we can do is we can go through and we can gather everyone's height and which side, either the front or the back of the room. Uh, so I could go through and actually get all of your heights and I could categorize half of you is sitting in the front and half of you is sitting in the back. The next thing that we can do is then we can take the difference. Okay, so like actually seeing, is there actually a difference between people that sit in the back and in the front? So we have then the mean of the back sitters, which is a weird term. I don't even know what that is. And we can subtract that from the mean of the front sitters. And we, we'd guess it'd be, you know, something. All that being said, no matter what you do, there will be some difference in means here. Even if there's no difference, there will be actual difference in reality. There will be some difference between these means. It will not be exactly the same. And there's a 50% chance that it will follow my hypothesis that the back sitters are taller than the front sitters, just by random chance. So how do we tell whether or not this mean that actually occurs here is any different than what could happen by random chance? Well, this is what I do. I randomly assign you to seats in the computer. I randomly assign you to different seats and see, just randomly putting people in the back and in the front how big of a difference, or was the range of differences that we could get? So imagine I just, I just, I took, all of you had a piece of paper, and that says right now where you are sitting, either in the front or in the back, right? And I took all of those pieces of paper, and you all put them into a bin, and I shuffled them up, and then you all drew back out where you're going again. So like you have no control over it and you see, oh, I sit in the back now, then you move to the back, or I still sit in the front, so I stay in the front. And another person, oh, I was in the back, but now I'm in the front, so that person comes to the front. So I'm randomizing where you're sitting, okay? And then we take that difference between the means again. And so then we have a randomized, a randomized mean of the back sitters minus the mean of the front sitters. And there's, whatever my hypothesis was, that maybe naturally the tall people sit in the back and the short people sit in the front. I have totally, I should have totally destroyed that because I've totally randomized where you go. But still, it's just one sample. So what I do is I go through and I do it again and I do it again and I do it again. I do this thousands of times. And essentially what I'm seeing then is how likely is it that I can get a um, difference in means that is just as extreme as what we actually saw. So here's one very big difference, is that we're using our actual observed data to test the randomness in that data with respect to whatever label we're putting on it. And this is very different than parametric statistics. Where essentially what I would do is I take the distribution of people in the front and the distribution of people in the back, I have the mean and the standard deviation, I'd see what is the probability that those two distributions come from one same parent distribution. That's making some assumptions about the data, but it makes the calculations far easier. In this case, I'm not making any assumptions that you're normally distributed in the front. I don't really care, or I don't really care that you have like the same variance as people in the back. We're just saying, given the people we actually have in class, 
if you guys just totally randomly sat wherever you wanted and had nothing to do with your height, could we still get the same degree, or was the likelihood that we could just get the same degree of difference between you guys? Anyways, all that being said, I am out of time now. We will go through on Friday exactly how this works in practice. And um, yeah, I will see you then. Are there, before you go, are there any questions real fast? Well, I guess it's like actually time to go. So if there are questions, stay by and ask me.